Oh, hello. What's going on? It's me. It's Galan at Night. It's Wednesday, January 27th of 2021. We've got a lot of stuff to dive into. The place where I currently work, Seattle, Washington, the Seattle Seahawks hired a new offensive coordinator late last night, Shane Waldron. The place where I used to work, Houston, Texas, the Houston Texans hired... I have to look him up because I don't, I hadn't heard of him until about a couple hours ago. David Culley to be their next head coach. All right. Yeah. Wow. What a hire. Should I react to that hiring first? There are only a few ways that you can win when you're trying to bring in a new coach. You want to make sure, I think more than anything, that you have the correct guy in power. But what you do also can backfire on you spectacularly. And if you don't do things right, you're going to end up pissing a lot of people off. And I say all of these things because what the Houston Texans did in hiring David Culley might end up working out. I've never heard of him again until today. It might work. But there is no way that you are going to make anyone happy with that move. There's only a couple of ways to win when you're hiring a head coach right away. In fact, I think there's really only one. You better hire a pretty name. I think the last time around when the Texans were looking for a new head coach, Bill O'Brien was doing his thing at Penn State. Might be a quarterback guru. Oh, yeah. Let's bring him aboard. And obviously things didn't really work out so well. They weren't terrible, though. Maybe the last year they were. But when you're going through a situation like the Texans are going through, you kind of want to find someone who... Yeah, maybe is going to be a name. And if you can't find that name, maybe it's some guy like Dan Campbell who you signed to a six-year contract and you have him do a press conference where he talks about how he's going to bite a bunch of people's kneecaps off. It's easier to do it when you're hiring an offensive coordinator. And we talked about it today on Danny and Gallant and on the Paul Gallant show that Shane Waldron for the Seattle Seahawks is a hire that I can get behind. I don't know if it's going to work out. I have some questions about it. Is he qualified? He's never been a real offensive coordinator. Is he someone that actually made a difference on that Rams coaching staff where he was passing game coordinator for all of those years? I don't know. I mean, they've had a bunch of good coaches on that staff. Matt LaFleur, who's now a head coach in Green Bay. He was their offensive coordinator in 17. In 2018, you had... Zach Taylor, not the president, the assistant coach. He's now the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. And then after that, you saw, who else is on that staff? Oh, yeah, Sean McVay, the guy everyone loves. How do you forget about him? What the heck was Shane Waldron doing with all those guys aboard? I don't know. But he was there, and he helped maximize the skills of guys like Robert Woods, Tyler Higbee at tight end. There are some statistics you can look at and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that looked good. It's easier to sell a coordinator, right? Even if it's not the most whelming of hires or it's not the sexiest of names, you can always find a way to spin it. I have no idea how you spin hiring David Culley, and I have to keep looking at his name on a screen so I remember it. And again, I don't want this to come off like it's some insult of David Culley. I have no idea how he's going to do as a head coach, but I don't think it's ever a good sign when you're hiring a a guy who is, is he 65 years old? To be your head coach when he hasn't really done a whole lot. He was an assistant head coach in Baltimore for the last couple of seasons, 2019 and 2020. He's been a wide receivers coach. He's been a passing game coordinator. But there's something about hiring a 65-year-old guy after you just had the oldest head coach in NFL history, Romeo Cornell, filling in on an interim basis. It doesn't really seem to make a whole lot of sense if you're trying to build some sort of big-picture program going forward. 
Uh, I'm just going to read some of the stuff about this dude on ESPN. Cully has spent the last three seasons in Baltimore. He just completed his 27th season as an NFL coach. Okay, he's experienced. He was the Ravens passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach. Well, the Ravens passing game hasn't really been good, and their wide receivers haven't really been good, but he was coaching with the Ravens, who used to be really good and now are pretty good. Yeah. It's it's maybe something that you can get Deshaun Watson on the same page as you with. But I don't know really what to base it on. I mean, if I'm Deshaun Watson, am I excited about a black head coach when I look at what this guy did as an assistant head coach and as an offensive, uh, not even an offensive coordinator, as a passing game coordinator in Baltimore, I'm not feeling so hot about Lamar Jackson and the way he's throwing. I don't know how I feel about this move. I probably wouldn't like it. So in a nutshell, if you want to win your coaching hire as an NFL team, don't do what the Texans did. It might end up working out, but in the immediacy, in the right now, what an underwhelming hire. But I suppose, hey, look, the, the progress, uh, excuse me, the process is over. So uh, there's that. Uh, a couple of questions before we move on. Hi, Paul from Brent. Woot, woot. Night show. Hope the Seahawks had GameStop shares. That uh, is something that I wish I could explain. I don't know a damn thing about stocks. I know that there are portfolios. I had to look up yesterday what shorting a stock means, which if, I'm, if, which, if I remember correctly means sell, and to long a stock means buy. So I think that I could probably watch the big short and not feel like a total idiot. <laughs> but I have no idea what the heck's going on there. Someone put together a Twitter video where they're explaining this whole GameStop stock, which, game, of course, GameStop's like basically the blockbuster of video game stores. They only sell video games in person, and then they pay you like 13 cents for your used video games. I guess you can still sell used video games, so there's that at least going for you, but their stocks have raised up. I have no idea how any of that stuff works. Uh, Rogers Green, Green Bay sweater? No. Bring back our Sonics, brother. Uh, Grandstand says, that sectional is huge. Yeah. Yeah, it's big. The first apartment that I was in, it wouldn't fit. So I had to make it go sideways, and basically I had to sit on the thing sideways, and it ended up giving me some back problems. But I'm very excited that this thing is back to normal. And as you can see, my little kitty cat's just hanging out right there. Uh, Rogers Green, more Texans being the Texans. Yeah, it, it feels that way. I'm sorry, guys. I wish I could say something better for you. I have something cooking in the works for you because, honestly, I just kind of feel bad for everyone there and the way that sports have gone. It has been awful since I left. What, Daryl Morey's gone? Uh, AJ Hinch is gone. Uh, so many bad things. James Harden's gone. That's actually good. You guys should be happy. James Harden's gone. How the hell do you root for that guy? Honestly, in good conscience. If you if you're a fan of basketball, how? I don't get it. Um, I don't know if they just told Deshaun Watson by Rogers. I really don't. I feel like there is a chance that this is something that Watson wanted. So I would sit back. It's, it's just underwhelming. Um, I can't read this. What does it say? Ooh, MCR, steal. If nothing else, this has to do with Shane Waldron. We have someone that knows the Rams scheme, so hopefully we can beat them. I know, right? My God, the Rams are the Se Seahawks' daddy. It's kind of annoying. But now they don't have um, Brandon Staley, their defensive coordinator, anymore. They are bringing in an entirely new offensive coordinator in Kevin O'Connell, which maybe means Sean McVay's not feeling so good. And, I mean, they've given less than ringing endorsements for their starting quarterback, Jared Goff. And, in fact, we heard that they might be doing an open competition at quarterback next year. Uh, Larry Bird. Not the Larry Bird, but uh, a Larry Bird says, you need me to kinds on getting to know Seahawks Twitter. We're working up to that. We're actually going to have Cable Thanos on, Josh Cashman. And I'm doing the interview with him tomorrow, so I'm going to get everything done before I go on a little quick trip to Las Vegas with a couple of my friends from Houston. Yeah, I know. It's probably not the smartest thing to go anywhere during a pandemic. I'm not going to lie, though. I'm losing my mind, and I need to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this is for my own mental well-being. So, uh, cut me a little slack. Thank you. I 
want to talk about something else that took place yesterday, and you might have seen my little Twitter video. It's a mocking Tom Rinaldi while he was doing those things on college game day-esque feature, making fun of this just unbelievably self back padding video that Tom Verducci, who's a Baseball Hall of Fame writer, made about what he does every single year. I think we need to create a holiday for the day that every single Baseball Hall of Fame voter decides that they're going to first off vote based off of their own self-created sense of morality. Ty Cobb's in the Hall of Fame, not a problem, even though he killed that guy and he bragged about it. Baseball being segregated for over half its existence and not allowing black people to play until what? Like the 1940s? That was just Jackie Robinson. You have the Boston Red Sox waiting another 12 years before they integrated as well. Oh, that's not a problem. But, God, if we were to put any people that played during the best era of baseball we've ever seen, the steroid era, oh, my goodness, it'll just ruin baseball going forward. There's a lot of back padding among them. And the funny thing is, these guys were making tons of money for the most part, these Baseball Hall of Fame voters. One, they were watching baseball, honestly, just return to its former glory after the 1994, um, 1994 strike. These guys made tons of money writing about baseball during a juiced era, and now all of a sudden they're acting like they've got an issue with the way that all of those guys were handling themselves. Are they really going to tell you honestly that they didn't like seeing those V-shaped uh, torsoed fellows be- blasting balls into outer space? I don't know how many of you guys watch um, some of the DC comic cartoons. Uh, for whatever reason, I, on HBO Max, I went into this deep dive of uh, Batman, <laughs> the cartoon. And I just find it funny how everyone in that show, they, they have like these itty-bitty waists, but their, their torsos are just like legitimately V's like this. It doesn't even make any sense. They wouldn't be able to fit through most doors. Well, that's what a lot of guys during the steroid era looked like. And some of them had some probably some issues after the fact. I imagine some of them have shrunken areas, if you will, in addition to enlarged heads, lots of back knee. I mean, you make some, I think, personal uh, sacrifices when you decide that you're going to juice. So, yeah, I mean, it might end up helping you out. Big picture, getting paid, your legacy and all that. But there are costs to doing it. You do have to live with them. But this is one of those days yesterday where baseball writers really like to tell you how important they are. And there is a specific couple of stories that I want to just dive into really quickly. First off, this is a story in The Athletic. It's written by Mark Carrick. The title is Voting for the Hall of Fame and the Science Behind the Pain. Okay, what pain are you talking about? Well, this voter voted for Kurt Schilling, but I guess wanted to find via a surgeon how and why he was feeling this pain in his brain. I mean, no one cares. Either you vote or you don't. And to be quite frank, Barry Bonds is the best baseball player I've ever seen. He was a terrifying hitter, and people were walking him with the bases loaded. Roger Clemens I wasn't a fan of. When I was growing up in Boston, he wasn't pitching particularly well. Well, then the next year, all of a sudden, he's in Toronto, and he's in better shape, and he's pitching great. Pitched well in Toronto. He pitched well for the Yankees. He pitched well for the Houston Astros. He had an awesome career. Was it aided by something? Probably. Do I care? No. Will I remember that guy forever? Yes. These baseball writers are basically telling you that the sport that you grew up watching and the era that you grew up watching doesn't matter because these guys were doing things in a way that they find immoral. Oh, spare me. It's an industry sports media that way too many of us take seriously. We cover a game for a living. I'm so thankful that people, for whatever reason, decide that they're going to add... 7.50 7.50 Pacific time, tune into me just blabbing into a microphone on YouTube about just all sorts of stupid stuff. Generally sports. Sports are just dumb things that we guys and girls and everyone, we, 
we watch them to pass the time and then we talk about them to pass the time. There's social experiences too. And we can go back to stands eventually. That's all sports are. It's not important. I mean, I see all these things taking place in the news every single day and I feel bad for the people that have to cover that stuff. But there is a separation in sports media between a couple of different factions. There's the sports talk show hosts like myself who most people find to be borderline stupid and loud. So, guilty. (laughs) There's the television people who are pretty, but also you don't really think about these people as having really strong opinions on anything. Kind of go where the wind pushes them. I get it, though. It's a little bit different. You you don't really want to be controversial in local television news. You have bloggers and you have podcasters and honestly I have a lot of respect for these people because a lot of these people have jobs and they're doing this on the side and they're doing a really good job with it and I think a lot of these guys could do the job that I do quite easily quite honestly so I like bloggers and I like podcasters and and I hope that it always comes off that way because I, I I really do like the people that do this on their own time this is a dream this is a dream job I, I'm lucky enough to get up to the top and to be paid for it again for whatever reason Then you got writers. Writers take themselves very seriously. Not all of them. Uh, My co-host, Danny O'Neill, is, I I think, one of the most down-to-earth people ever. He's really intelligent, but down-to-earth, doesn't think himself to be better than anybody. I cannot say the same about most sports writers in that category. And I don't want to paint with a broad brush like I have when I'm younger. But there's something about sports writers that I've always found, with some of them, to be just... People that love the smell of their own farts. And then you have a separate category of writers that cover sports. Baseball writers. Wow. I'm a little biased against baseball writers because one of my first days ever reporting on a baseball game, I asked Ozzie Guillen, then the manager of the Miami Marlins, about a scandal that he was dealing with. Scandal. I don't even know if it's a scandal. He was dealing with a lot of backlash in Miami. In an interview with a magazine, he said something that was translated to, because it was a Spanish magazine, I love Fidel Castro. Now, it could have been taken out of context. I don't remember what it was. But baseball suspended him, and it was a big deal. He's the manager of a team in Miami. Miami has an unbelievably large uh, Cuban-American population and just Cuban immigrant population, people that fled Cuba. I'm not going to act like I went to the ballpark that day saying, you know what, I'm going to ask this question because one of my best friends is Cuban-American, which is actually true. No, I, I knew I was getting paid like $15 an hour to cover the pregame for a game between the Astros and the Marlins, both of whom were crap at the time. So I think to myself, okay, well, I'm going to try to earn my money. This is one of his first series back after being suspended. And I asked him, I thought a pretty fair question, as the, nervously, if you, if you watch it, you can, you can hear that my heart's pounding. I was nervous to ask it. This is a guy in Ozzie Gein who I always thought was a funny character. And I asked him a question, and uh, has the backlash cooled down after what you said in Miami? He said, bleep and grow up, mother bleeper, are you kidding me? I walked away, he said, nice try. I, I, I don't think he was trying to be mean or anything like that. And I thought it was funny, I laughed, and then I tweeted about it. And honestly, I, I, the story I figured was going to go away. I, I got a little bit of clout out of it, but not a whole lot. But I go up into the press box and a baseball writer by the name of Richard Justice, who covers baseball in Houston, decides to go up to me and lecture me. And I'm not going to act like Richard Justice is one of these baseball writers who t- takes himself so seriously with the Baseball Hall of Fame voting. And in fact, that's actually not the case. But um, that moment stuck with me and I should probably let it go. But it's one of those things that I hold against baseball writers. I'm blocked by John Heyman on Twitter because I was trolling him a little bit. But there is this lack of a sense of humor that they have and a real just self-important feel to them. And I'm just like, you guys cover the third most relevant sport in America. If that. Football, basketball, baseball. And baseball is going lower and lower every single year. I'm not going to knock their profession entirely, but I I just feel like they carry themselves with this strange idea that they're better than other people. And this day, yesterday, is the holiday where they essentially celebrate accidentally, ironically, unintentionally, 
what obnoxious people they are. And I'm just going to read a couple of passages from people who have tweeted and written about the Baseball Hall of Fame process. I saw this tweet um, by Jose Jesus de Ortiz, who I actually get along with, but I, I've never actually met him either. But, you know, internet acquaintances. He tweeted, I can say I regret making two of the picks that I made for the Hall of Fame. I think it was Roger Clemens and Bobby Abreu because he tagged them. If those two don't get in, they won't get my vote again next year. Well, if you regret making the pick, why'd you make the pick? And then when you ask them that question, that's where they say, well, that's why you got to read my column. Okay, I get it. I mean, writing about stuff this time of year for baseball writers has got to be difficult. And if you're a baseball Hall of Fame voter, of course you're going to talk about what you voted for and why you voted. And I am jealous. I mean, these guys actually get to determine who goes into that museum in Cooperstown, which I've never been to and probably never will go to now that I don't live on the East Coast anymore. And I'm not, not that interested in it. The only Hall of Fame I think I'm ever going to go to again is, is the Pro Football Hall of Fame when Tom Brady gets inducted. That's probably it. And even then, mm, Canton, Ohio. Ugh. Now I'm sounding elitist. Um, you see something like that, and then you see all the 14 people who turned in blank ballots. Just don't turn in a ballot. It's like you're showing off some sort of protest as if you're, you're, you're doing what you wish you could have done when the election was taking place and all the buildup to the election was taking place. Well, this is my form of resistance. This is how I be a citizen. Calm down. Uh, Bob Nightingale, uh, I think of the USA Today. I think he does some stuff with radio.com. Yeah, whatever. His headline, why I voted for Latroy Hawkins on my baseball Hall of Fame ballot. Who the hell is Latroy Hawkins? I mean, I had to Google him. I remembered that in, I think, uh, All-Star Baseball 2003, I had a season with the Twins, and he might have played for them. He is the only person that voted for Latroy Hawkins and wrote a column about it. This guy has a 75-94 and 94 all-time record, an ERA of 4.31. And the reason that he voted for him is because Hal McRae didn't get a Hall of Fame vote, and he didn't have a Hall of Fame vote to give Hal McRae a Hall of Fame vote. So 28 years later, he's just going to vote in some guy that he respects, Latroy Hawkins, but who wasn't a very good baseball player. All right. Then you got Jay Mariotti. You might remember him. He used to be on Around the Horn all the time. Not the best of individuals. You can do Googling yourself as far as uh, why he had his fall from grace because he used to be a big deal as far as sports writers go. But he had a piece for, I think, Barrett Sports Media. Hank Aaron died, and putting Barry Bonds in would be disrespectful was essentially the premise of it. It was as if, if you were to induct Barry Bonds into the Hall of Fame, you would be disparaging peeing on the grave of Hank Aaron. That's at least the premise that I got, to put it in cliff notes for you, having read that article. Yeah, I, I doubt Hank Aaron would be very happy to see someone like Barry Bonds, whose head, again, is like the size of a grapefruit, maybe two, three, four grapefruit. It grew huge from the time when he was young with the Pittsburgh Pirates to the time when he was on the San Francisco Giants and getting walked with the bases loaded. He was always a great player, always was going to be a Hall of Fame player, but things changed. Yeah, maybe he wouldn't have taken it so well if Barry Bonds got into the Hall of Fame. But who cares, right? I mean, this is about remembering the best players ever. This is not a toy for these baseball writers. This is not also something that players, I feel like, should even have that much say in as far as who gets in. Like, this is for the people who watch the game. That's what the Baseball Hall of Fame is for. It's not for anybody else. It's a, it's a museum to remember the sport. Obviously, the steroid era happened. It was the best era of baseball. I, I don't love baseball the same way that I did during that era. And I just find the guys who cover the sport and the way that they do it so obnoxious. So I think we should make a, hel a holiday for them. Hall of Fame Induction Day. Because you're going to see a bunch of posts that say, My column. And a bunch of people that really think that what they do is this noble endeavor. You're literally filling out checks as uh, boxes on a piece of paper. And you're turning it in by mail for whatever reason. So there you go. Uh, what do we got here? And ask Gallant anything. Alfonso Rivera, how do you feel about the hiring of Shane Waldron? I like it. I'm optimistic about it. But is it really fair for me to make grand predictions off of it? No, he's an offensive coordinator. He was with the all Los Angeles Rams coaching staff. Some of my reservations include that the Rams offense fell off a cliff from the end of 2018 until today. Could that be all, all, all on Jared Goff? Absolutely. Could it all be on Shane Waldron? I guess. I mean, who, who knows why that happened? 
Um, Brent McKinney, do you think the Seahawks will still want to run the ball with power like the good old days? I feel like everyone's freaking out a little bit too much on that front. I don't. I don't get that impression. I think that in bringing in, bringing in Shane Waldron, a passing game coordinator, you're looking for a guy who is going to maximize the receivers and tight ends that Russell Wilson has to work with and who is going to make the passing game more than just throwing the football straight down the field. I heard a lot of talk that, that's pointed blame at Pete Carroll and, and that and fear over the Seahawks potentially going back to what they used to be with, with Pete Carroll. And I would just encourage them to take a look at what the offense was in the second half of the season and say, do you really want to return to that? Because that was a more modern approach on offense. That was a, we're going to throw the football down the field. And guess what? There was no variance to that thing at all. Where was the intermediate passing? Where was the short passing? It didn't exist in that offense. Where was Russell Wilson just rolling out of the pocket? My God. Didn't see any of that either. Uh, Alfonso Rivera. Bro, Kurt Schilling missing the Hall of Fame by 0.1% is ridiculous. It wasn't 0.1. I think it was like 3 4% or so. I think it has to be 75%. And he got like 71.1. Look, Kurt Schilling is like your... The stuff he posts online... How do I say this? And walk the fence. Ah, screw it. The stuff he posts online is like something one of your idiot relatives is going to post on Facebook. And let's be honest, Facebook, even some of you guys who are on Facebook right now, largely a cesspool, especially when it comes to all the memes that are placed upon it that have no basis in reality. I don't like Facebook. I don't like Twitter. In fact, I don't like any social media. But I'm talking to you because I love you. Facebook is littered with all sorts of these just awful memes that you see your relatives who really don't know any better who look at these things and they're like, oh, this is a fact. And Kurt Schilling was doing extreme versions of that and calling for some things that are pretty messed up. Should that keep him out of the Baseball Hall of Fame when Ty Cobb claimed he killed a guy? No. Kurt Schilling's one of the best pitchers in playoff history, so he should be in. There you go. Uh, what other questions do we have? Oh, some of them, my H-Town crew is here. Spencer Nolan, hey, Paul, what's up, Spence? Uh, Brad Baker, who I'm going to Vegas with this coming weekend. Can we get Fletcher in the T-Ball Hall of Fame? Well, I suppose that would depend on 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 his children, right? Because I don't think you can get in the T-Ball Hall of Fame. I don't even know if there's a T-Ball Hall of Fame. There probably isn't a T-Ball Hall of Fame, but I imagine somebody made a T-Ball Hall of Fame. Probably would be pretty creepy to make a T-Ball Hall of Fame, though. So I'm just going to dodge that question entirely. <laughs> uh, what else do we got? Blip, 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 blip. Uh, Larry Bird, thoughts on the Barstool and the Hockey League controversy? I, I don't know what the NWHL stands for. I've looked into it. I always feel like there is gray area in the middle, and I have a lot of friends co-workers who think Barstool is this vile platform. Personally, I don't, but I grew up reading it. So I think I'm a little biased when it comes to that. I feel like Barstool giving any league a platform is probably good for the league. I think that calling anyone, and from what I read... There may have been some members of the league who called Barstool a website of white supremacy. I don't know if, if I'd go that far, and that's the problem today. I think people will say, oh, well, this person's Republican. He's a right-winger. He must be a white supremacist. And then you have it on the other side, too. Oh, this person on the left, he doesn't have a job. He's Antifa. He's a communist. Like, I... I don't want to go into those conversations because there's no winning them, right? Like, I know right now I'm probably ticking somebody off who's watching it. So all I'll say on that is that there, there are two sides to every single story. Barstool's going to be able to get its side of the story out probably better than the other side, the uh, National Women's Hockey League. I'm guessing that's what it is. So I don't know. We'll see how it unfolds. Uh, to be quite honest, I don't really care. <laughs> I suppose is the best way to answer that. Uh, Stone Jam, Gallant, do you have a nickname? Yes, but they're both self-given, and you can laugh all you want at it. I loved Cordell Stewart when I was growing up, before he said, after losing to the Patriots, that sometimes the better team doesn't win, before getting absolutely pantsed on Monday Night Football to 
open the season a couple of um, a couple of weeks later. But I liked the nickname Slash, so I, I gave myself the nickname Slash when I was playing for the Hanover Pee Wee Mites. And then when I was a senior in high school and at football practice, I'd start walking around practice acting like I was Terrell Owens, just saying, I love me some me, and then running around going, woo woo. I think part of it might have been inspired by the video game Gears of War and Coltrane, but I started calling myself the PG Train. So, yeah, that's another nickname. When I started working at Sports Radio 610, Fred Davis started calling me Pauly G, which is why the Bistro and Pauly G show existed. Um, so I went by that for a little bit. But, um, yeah, I guess those are my three nicknames. I like to call myself Pow, like P-A-W-L, because I think it's funny. And I think it is a good way to show some of the disdain that people that don't like me, who listen still, uh, might have for me. Pow, pow, you don't know anything about the Seahawks or the Texas, pow. Um, do, 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 uh, Leo, Paul, any comments on the Texans curveball head coaching hire? Yeah, it's boring. <laughs> and I don't know if that means it's going to be bad. Uh, Zach Morgan, what's your take on Wilson taking a page out of Brady's book, and taking a pay cut to keep talent? People overestimate that. Brady took a pay cut. It wasn't a huge pay cut. Brady was always getting paid a lot of money. And... People acted like he was taking $30 million less than he should. No, he was still getting paid a very good amount. It's like maybe five, six, seven million million, $7 million less than the average quarterback. There are always ways that you can finagle the cap around, I think, to fit a contract in that you really want and you backload money. The cap is a little bit more flexible than in, you would see in, in some other sports. Um, but it's definitely clear that Russell Wilson just doesn't operate that way. He hired a baseball agent. Baseball agents... They're not the kind of people that are going to, after a very strong, hard-fought negotiation, say, you know what? We're going to come back, and we're going to give a little money back. So Russell Wilson's agent, Mark Rogers, is never going to let that happen. I'm not going to tell a guy how to handle his money. I'm just not. Honestly, I would, if I were going to tell someone to maybe take a little less money, it would probably be the Seahawks linebacker, Bobby Wagner. Uh, Kyle Blair, if you had to make one big bet at, spo at a sports book this weekend, what would it be? Uh, it would probably be on some sort of Tom Brady stat. What would it be? I would say wh whatever line there is for amount of touchdown passes or passing yards, I'd probably put the over on that just so I have a little extra to root for during the game. All right. A couple things to get to before I hit the road. How many of you guys know what love language is? So this morning on the... Danny and Gallant radio program featuring the one, the only, Michael Bumpus. We got into some rabbit hole and ended up talking about love language. And we got into that rabbit hole because we were talking about Aaron Rodgers. And <laughs> the best way to keep Aaron Rodgers around. And Bump jokes, words of affirmation. I went on a rant. I had been on the dating apps. I've been off the dating apps for a while. I will probably be getting back on them before I go to Las Vegas. But I've been off the dating apps since like December 14th. Had a bad date. It's kind of saddened by the way things went afterwards. And I was like, I need to work on myself. Which is what a lot of people will tell you to do when you've uh, had something not go so hot. But I see people on social media, not social media, on the dating apps all the time. And, the, and, Whenever I saw someone say, my love language is this, my love language is that, I'm like, I, I don't care. And I don't want to see it. And I just thought it was stupid, the idea of a love language, that a relationship and how to get to someone's heart is going to be found through one of five different ways. And I suppose it's helpful and it's probably beneficial for people who are in relationships for a while. But when you first get to know somebody, do you really need to know their love language? I think it's a cheat code. I feel like you figure that person out on the fly. And you figure out what you like and you figure out what you don't like. But love language, it's entirely subjective. So apparently you can be um, someone who feels love and shows love through a variety of different ways. There's uh, receiving gifts. There's quality time. There's physical touch. There's acts of service. And there's words of affirmation. So there's this website and you can take the test. And it's like, 
choose A or B, choose A or B, and there's probably like 50 choices, and you'll end up seeing questions that are the exact same question just asked again, and you have to pick between the two. So for me, number one is physical touch. What a surprise. Makes me sound like a horn dog. Uh, number two for me was uh, words of affirmation. So I also like to have my ass kissed, I guess. <laughs> number three was acts of service. Um, then it was quality time, which was pretty low. <laughs> Probably not a good sign for anybody. And then receiving gifts. At the very least, you know I'm cheap. Everyone does this, apparently. I don't get it. I don't. I get it can be helpful, but whenever I see someone on these dating apps that has that in their profile, my love language is receiving gifts. Like, well, especially for that person. I'm swiping left so hard. I don't play that. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> Paul, would you pay for a date if it involves physical touch? Shut up, Brad. Jeez. No, I'm not going to pay for a date that involves physical touch because I know exactly what kind of date you're talking about. The kind of date that maybe in Las Vegas would not be frowned upon. Stop. Bad boy. Um, what else do we got here? Because love language. Yeah, sorry. It's just annoying to me. Uh, Brant McKinney, Paul, those are memorable eyebrows. I once had a beautician just started trimming mine before asking. She must have seen the look of horror on my face. Ever happened to you? I don't let anyone touch my eyebrows. Only I do. Pluck them in the middle. Got one of those Revlon comb things. Boop, boop, boop. Do it every couple of days. So there you go. Uh, what else do we got? Oh, yeah, I did want to talk about television. I finally finished the third season of... Yellowstone. Oh my God, what an ending. That was awesome. And now, of course, we have to wait. If you haven't watched the show, it's on the Paramount app. Honestly, I recommend getting the Paramount app just so you can watch Yellowstone. It's that good of a show. That show is number one in my book right now. Because I know not everybody's a Star Wars fan like myself. I think The Mandalorian, the past season that we just saw of it, is some of the best television that we have seen since Game of Thrones, when Game of Thrones was actually good. But the problem is, I know a lot of people aren't the biggest sci-fi fans. I would encourage anyone to watch Yellowstone. And I think right now it's got the TV show Gauntlet. And I'm curious before we hit the road if any of you guys have an alternative. Because right now I'm trying to go through a list of TV shows to watch. I'm going to start watching WandaVision on um, Disney+, Plus, which is an extension of the Avengers universe. Um, there's a couple of shows on Hulu. Letterkenny is one of them, which I highly recommend. And I've been watching that one for a while. There's one show, I think it's called The Great. It seems like it's a comedy take on uh, Catherine the Great or something like that. Seemed interesting. But what other shows are you guys looking at? Brad Baker says, Friends. Friends? Brad, no. You watch that show? Why? I suppose Brad is probably going to give me crap also because I don't like The weekend. So while I'm on that, this is going to be the last thing I talk about. I don't want to hear that stupid song by The weekend ever again. And I know we're going to hear it at halftime of the Super Bowl, but every single commercial break this whole NFL season has probably featured a Pepsi ad and it has featured that song by the weekend, which actually has a banging synth track in the background. Sounds like that. I heard that for the first time and on a couple of bump ins to our radio show, we have the music and, you know, you're coming back into a segment. Oh yeah, this sounds good. I had never heard the lyrics on top of it. Oh my God. It sounds awful. You guys think I'm whiny. That is just an objectively terrible song. And they play it over and over and over and over again. Every single Monday Night Football broadcast, they play that more than you would see a college football broadcast back in the day play Imagine Dragons or, or TNT broadcasts who were playing like that Kesha Pitbull song, Playoffs, Playoffs. This, uh, Linkin Park on TNT, burn it to the ground. Like I heard that song less. I heard the Pitbull song less. I heard Imagine Dragons last, then I've heard this stupid song by The Weeknd. And honestly, I'm not going to watch the halftime show entirely because of it. Because the song sounds like... <laughs> Your touch. Awful. Awful song. 
yes, I'm an old man yelling at a cloud. Give me some good music that appeals to everybody, please. Instead of some dude on a, like who's wearing a leather jacket and gloves. Want to be Michael Jackson? God, I hate that song. Sorry, The Weeknd. I don't even think it's your fault. They have just tried to market the heck out of that song to the point that now it's stuck in my head and I feel the need to get it stuck in everyone's head, but not in the way that you traditionally hear it. I want you all to hear whenever that song comes on. Awful. Um, song Ruin says Stone Jams. Cool. Kyle Blair. Paul, that song has been out for a year. Kyle, you know me. I don't know when any music comes out ever. And I just discovered grunge music five years ago, and I think that should explain my musical knowledge. Thank you very much for tuning into today's, tonight's edition of Galan at Night. Sorry, Texans fans, that is quite the underwhelming hire. I am not there anymore to rant about it. David Cully, good luck. Shane Waldron's the new Seahawks offensive coordinator. We'll see how that goes. I'm optimistic. I do have some questions. I have a blog about it up at 710sports.com. Please follow me on all my things, at Paul Gallant on YouTube at Seattle Sports, P-A-W-L, on Instagram, at Gallant Says on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Paul Gallant Sports. I appreciate all the support. Everyone who listens to the Paul Gallant Show, 10 to 11, every single day on 710 ESPN Seattle, and more importantly, Danny and Gallant, 7 to 10, every single morning on 710 ESPN Seattle. I appreciate you guys who tune into this. And stay tuned for an episode of Getting to Know Seahawks Twitter tomorrow. I'm going to talk with Josh Cashman. It'll probably be up very late tomorrow night. So, y'all... Have a wonderful Wednesday night. So long, farewell, and you will hear from me tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock Pacific.